And tonight we've got a few, well, a few faces. We've got four people. We've got Melissa Opperman, um, who is a subspecialist or subspecialist trained physiotherapist. She's interested in uh, concussion and cervical spine problems. Um, we've got Chris Hanna, who is in his sort of access um, cupboard or man shed. I'm quite sure what you are in, Chris, but anyway. Cupboard. And Simon, who's ruined his look by wearing some corded headphones. Um, we just spent the last five minutes trying to advise him whether he should wear the headphones or not wear the headphones. So um, I think you'll agree the headphones have been a welcome addition to the uh, to the session. Um, so I think uh, we're doing something slightly different tonight. So we're going for um, a, an online journal club. So we, we have posted the links to the articles. Some of them are open source, some of them are not. And um, we haven't posted them online just because I'm not sure about copyright, um, but I think we're allowed to do peer-to-peer -peer sharing. So if anyone's interested, maybe um, send us a message on Twitter or, or Facebook, like a private message, and we can send them back to you um, to have a bit of a look at. But um, at least I think, well, I know my paper is, I carefully selected an open source one for everyone at home there. But if you, if you want to get the papers, we can send those out to you. Um, Melissa's doing a, a, a concussion topic. I'm talking a little bit about shoulder surgery, which is ironic given that I'm not a surgeon. Um, Chris is talking about PRP, and um, Simon, being the surgeon, is going to try and discourage you from referring patients for arthroscopy. So um, it's a slightly random um, setup tonight. Um, we might pass on to you, Chris, to lead off. Um, I remember a few weeks ago, we did a poll about what you were planning to do next week um, about whether you're going to see patients face to face. and um, at that time, kind of about 15% of you, I think, from memory, were planning on seeing patients face to face the next week. I just kind of thought it might be interesting to repeat the poll again, just for us. We're not doing anything about it, it's only for those of us on this call, um, just to kind of see whether people's plans are changing and whether um, their approach to practice is changing. So I thought that that might be an interesting little bit of peer review that we could do um, as we go. But um, I think for now, I'll hand over to you, Chris. Great. Um, Kick me off with a paper about PRP, yeah? Yeah, so this is a paper that's probably been referenced a couple of times in the last uh, two or three weeks, I guess, with the, the two osteoarthritis sessions that we've had. And so I thought I'd go and have a little read of it and uh, bring back what my sort of take on it uh, for a session like tonight. I don't want anyone to walk away disappointed from tonight. And I know if you read the advertising that I was going to talk to you, oh, it's a... Uh, little technical glitch here. Here we go. Uh, Mark mentioned that I might give you some tips from the workshop. So my little tip for you, if you're struggling to drill through anything, these puppies will drill through anything. So if you've accidentally hardened the blade of the knife you're making and you haven't drilled the holes yet, tungsten carbide tips are sold as masonry bits, but they'll drill through anything and uh, keep, keep going. So that's my one little tip for the night. So into it. Um, if any questions come up, just make sure you post them in the Q&A button down the bottom. So um, down the bottom, look for the Q&A tab, and um, either I can ask the question or Kristen type in some answers. Cool. So um, the title of the paper is PRP Injections for the Treatment of Knee Osteoarthritis, a Meta-Analysis of Randomized Controlled Trials. And that pretty much explains uh, the whole paper, really. It, the authors were from Italy and Switzerland. And they wanted to look at the latest evidence uh, based only on randomized control trials, comparing PRP with other injectables. Their approach was pretty standard. They searched a number of the databases that we normally look through and included gray literature. In the gray literature, they didn't find anything useful, but they found uh, a couple of unpublished studies, which they haven't included, and some studies that have been reported as being underway. So there'll be you know, modifications to this in the future. They use the PRISMA guidelines for meta-analysis, which is pretty standard. And so out of 3,277 papers that they identified over a decade from January 2011 to January 2020, they came up with 34 randomized controlled trials uh, comparing PRP with some other injectable. So it wasn't PRP with any of the oral supplements that are talked about or any kind of treatment or movement or strengthening. It was purely injectable versus injectable. One of the interesting things I thought was how balanced the studies were, 1400 PRP, 1426 in the control groups, 
when they followed them to completion, the numbers over all of the studies added up to be exactly the same. So 1,314 were left in the PRP group and 1,314 were left in the control group, which is probably some kind of statistical coincidence. The controls that they were comparing were quite interesting, uh, quite a lot of hyaluronic acid, cortisone, uh, some studies were cortisone with anesthetic, some without, saline, ozone, and um, there was one placebo controlled trial of ozone and the control for ozone was air, but, um, and then prototherapy dextrose um, was used as a control as well. They defined what they considered to be minimal clinically important differences. So one of the things that I think is real important to think about when you're trying to help someone with osteoarthritis is there, there's never a cure. You can't put it back the way it was when they were 16 and they're not going to have a normal knee. They're going to have something that they can manage, but that's the answer is that we're looking for a way of managing it. And so when you're looking for a benefit or, or how does this help and you get an answer that says, yes, it does. The fact is that sometimes the help isn't that much. So minimally clinically, so minimal, sorry, clinically important differences on the Womax score is about 15%. No, that's not, that's not right. It's, it's less than 10%, sorry. And Womack pain, you have to change it by 15. Um, stiffness, not so much. Function, visual analog score, the minimal clinically important difference was only 1.37. So that's kind of ballpark. Most people would consider, depending on what they're looking at, one to two to be an important difference. Um, and you can see the rest of the markers there. The interesting, uh, sorry, before they started, baselines weren't significantly different, age similar, um, male to female ratio, more, more females than males, but the two groups were very similar, body mass index very similar. They've sort of gone through the um, comparisons for placebo, hyaluronic acid, corticosteroid, ozone, it's all in the paper. I've just picked a couple out here. So this is um, comparing PRP with placebo. And the interesting thing that was pretty consistent, no matter what you looked at, was that in the first month, if there was an improvement, everybody got that improvement, but there wasn't a significant difference between the PRP and the placebo or the PRP and the hyaluronic acid. Um, and so it, the effects become more obvious as you get further down the track. So once you get out to um, 12 months, there's a much bigger difference uh, at that point. And so that's been a pretty consistent finding so no significant differences at one month, but increasingly significant uh, as the time went by. Sorry, I don't know where I've skipped to there. This is a same table for hyaluronic acid from, from the paper I'm presenting, but again, very little different at the one month for each of these markers. So this is the WOMAC, the overall score, but you can look at subclasses for pain, stiffness and function, visual analog scale, very similar. Not much difference at the one month mark, but out to the 12 month mark, the difference is becoming more significant. And I guess that was one of the conclusions was that um, what they were at pains to say is that it's not better than hyaluronic acid or placebo in that first month, but the benefits of it are persisting over time and, and the difference between them becomes clearer at the six to 12 month mark. So when there's an improvement, everybody seems to get that in the first month partly because they've had someone stick a needle in their knee and there's some expectations around that. But the actual benefit persists much longer than hyaluronic acid, corticosteroid, or any of the other injectables. Um, the trend was consistent for all of the scales that they looked at. Um, at the six to 12 month mark, the improvements were significant both statistically and clinically. And an interesting thing they did pick up was that there's no increased risk of adverse effect with PRP compared to any of the other injectables. They feel that it's a simple, low cost, minimally invasive intervention that gives people the benefit. But they also make the point that despite the evidence coming up with this conclusion, there are a lot of variables that you have to think about. And so some of those variables are in which particular type of PRP are you going to be uh, offering your patients? So you can have just pure PRP that you extract blood centrifuge and just use a needle to pull out the fluffy buffy zone sorry um, but there are so many different ways of extracting it you can get leukocyte rich PRP platelet rich fibrin platelet rich fibrin matrix um, activated platelets rich in growth factors um, autologous concentrated plasma autologous conditioned plasma um, platelet releasate platelet gel 
there's a whole bunch of them but there are also other things there are you know how how long did you spin it for what how many g's did you apply how much anticoagulant did you apply to it before you took it out and mixed it up um how much volume did you use what was the leukocyte content those sorts of things are important as well and then there's the variables of your patient selection so is it a single compartment of the knee is it mild moderate or severe um you know what's what's their bmi is that going to have an influence on the outcome as well um is it a primary osteoarthritis it's involving all joints symmetrically which has a different uh, underlying pathology than a secondary osteoarthritis that's occurred as a result of a trauma so yeah there's there's evidence out there that shows prp is good for these people it's it's better over time than any other injection we have but it's still a little bit hard to predict in an individual whether you're going to be able to make a big difference for them um one of the important conclusions that i thought that it was just one line that they had in there was that uh, important placebo effects have been shown in almost every knee injection study so that was just a one-liner dropped in there nothing followed up nowhere in the paper does it talk about how effective the placebo is at changing pain it only compares placebo with prp and so i thought one of the interesting things to do might be to go and look at some of the papers that they're re referencing and try and extract that information out of them and again that's an interesting process as well because if you just look at the abstract none of the authors are giving that information they're comparing what they're championing with their control but they're not saying that you know this much effect was seen in this group and this much effect was seen in that group so you do have to dive in a little bit so i thought i'd just grab one paper i looked at a few but this one from lynn and colleagues uh in taiwan they've uh, done a study comparing um prp with hyaluronic acid and normal saline and if you look at this first box here at the one month mark you can see there's this little blue marker here that showed that all of these reached minimally sorry minimal clinically important differences at the one month mark so that's normal staline hyaluronic acid and prp all reached a threshold to give patients a, a clinically significant improvement in their in their pain management over time however prp is the one that sort of carried that right through till the end and, and the difference becomes bigger as as we get further out to that 12 month mark um yeah, so it was just, I just thought it was interesting to see that even normal saline had a significant improvement effect at the one month mark. It's just that that didn't persist for any length of time. So that seemed to fly by a heap faster than I anticipated it to. Maybe I should have talked slower or uh, used more words, but um, yeah, that, that's my take on it. Were there any questions, Mark? Um, the, no questions so far. I think your point is a good one around. Um, the different types of PRP and um, making sure that if you are referring someone for PRP that they're using a reputable system and that you have some confidence that you're trying to simulate one of the papers that are, are being used. Um, it's yeah, it's a comment rather than a question. So I'm not sure um, whether anyone else out there has anything that they want to add or ask about PRP. We have talked about it a little bit, but. Um, it is interesting how the evidence seems to be increasingly shown that there is a benefit of some kind. Um, so all right, we've got one question. I'm working on my laptop here, um, <laughs> which is not ideal here in grandma and granddad's house. Um, so it talks about what type of PRP do you use or recommend? Um, so perhaps I might answer that because um, I have recently done a review of the different available systems. So we've just changed to a different product, um, which is um, a Zimmer product. Um, there are a few different reasons we've chosen to go with that one. Um, and the main reason is that it's one of the products used in some of the clinical trials. So it has um, evidence around tendons um, and some evidence around um, chondral lesions in the knee. Um, it's also, relatively speaking, a contained product, so it's um, easy to make. There's less risk of contamination or um, needle stick injuries and other problems. Um, and the protocol is only one injection. So in terms of um, it's relatively cost effective, um, we don't have to you know, go through a three injection or five injection protocol. So for the patient, they pay for one kit. Um, they have one injection um, and we can be fairly confident that we're following a methodology that's been published in the research. So um, that's what we do there. Um, 
Chris, there's a, a question here about the evidence of combining hyaluronic acid and PRP. Um, there are some kits that, that do you know, put those together in the same kit. Um, have you got a view on that? I, I couldn't find any evidence uh, about that. That was one of the questions I have because traditionally I've used that combination. I I personally find it to be better than hyaluronic acid on its own, but I think, you know, I possibly that's because the PRP is making the difference, but yeah. I, I didn't find any evidence on it. No. Um, and here is a great question that I'm really into. Um, thanks, Tracy. So are there any comparative studies with PRP in exercise and education? which are the best practice um, kind of treatment options for osteoarthritis over injectables? Um, I wish I knew, but I was sort of focusing in on only the injectables. I mean, that's that's my question as well, is that, you know, I, I don't ever use an injectable on its own. That's, I'd sort of talk to people about the treatment pyramid approach and at the bottom of your physical things, get moving, uh, get strong, nothing looks after a joint except the muscles around it. Um, topical, oral, injectable come next and then surgical at the top of the pyramid. Yeah, I guess one of the things is a lot of these papers, um, they talk about rehabilitation in the placebo arm. So everybody gets the same rehabilitation, everybody gets the same education, but the papers never really flesh out what that rehabilitation is and whether it's best practice. So you could read it one of either ways. You could say, look, the placebo arm gets best practice and the PRP arm gets best practice, but I suspect in reality it's PRP or close to nothing. Um, is my, my, I'm a cynical bastard. Anyway, um, yeah. and then one last one here, Chris, is just around what do you suggest or recommend for patients following a PRP injection around timeframes to return to rehab and that sort of thing? So it's not uncommon for patients to get a flare after a PRP and we don't seem to get the big issues that some of our Australian colleagues have had where they've had people with quite significant pain. But normally my advice is to allow any flare to settle and then start with gentle rhythmic movement after that. And normally I'd say a week down the track from the injection, if, if they're asymptomatic, that they should start some resistance training at that stage. The question before about exercise in comparison just rang, rang my memory. Um, just in terms of um, assets or things that are useful to look at if you're interested, obviously there's the um, GLAD program, Good Living with Arthritis from Denmark which is, is a good approach to dealing with lower limb osteoarthritis. There's the PEAK um, online learning module from Kim Bennell and her colleagues in Melbourne, which is quite good to look at. There's um, osteoarthritis optimism from Greg Lehman, which is <laughs> very entertaining little video clips on how to self-manage your own osteoarthritis uh, free. Um, so there's a few different um, resources out there online for people who are interested. And obviously we have the osteoarthritis clinic at Axis. So. Nice, um, Chris. So just um, any um, any questions, just we'll, we'll run any questions or, or things through the Q&A. So I, I can see a couple of you put your hand up, but um, it just becomes more manageable if you can input things through the Q&A. So um, thanks for that, Chris. If there's any more questions, put them through and we'll, we'll come back to them. Um, but I'd like to introduce Melissa, who's going to uh, talk a little bit about compassion um, in a recent paper in the, the BJSM. Over to you, Melissa. I wasn't very concerned she's going to start speaking Afrikaans um, and definitely no one will be able to understand what she's saying. So um, remember to speak quietly and carefully, Melissa. Okay, cool. I'll try my best. Okay, evening everyone. Thank you for joining us for this journal club. Um, my name is Melissa and I work as um, one of the physios here at Axis, taking care of our concussion patients. And I'm here to give you my thoughts on a recent publication by Reed et al. Um, so she did, a, or they did a systematic review and a meta-analysis on do physical interventions improve outcomes following a concussion? which to me was basically just a review of evidence supporting us as clinicians seeing these patients on why we tell them to continually do their exercises. Um, and this article was published, this is where the Afrikaans starts going, um, this article was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine as early as last week, so it's um, fresh off the press. 
Um, so they did um, have two questions that they were going to review or try to answer with this um, review. So they looked at what is the effect of incorporating subthreshold aerobic exercises, neck treatment, vestibular or ocular therapy um, into concussion management for acute or ongoing symptoms. But they also wanted to see what would the effect be if you incorporated all these different interventions as an individualized, tailored, presentation-specific multimodal intervention into the acute and ongoing management of a concussion. Um, so they looked at two, um, at 12 randomized controlled trial studies. Um, seven looked at this active rehab approach. One looked at if you only applied vis, um, vestibular therapy. One looked at only neck three treatment. And then three looked at if we did this individually tailored multimodal intervention, um, what would be the outcome? And so from the get go, um, I kind of just love the introduction of this article um, because normally with any article around this topic, we are met with this elaborate definition of concussion or mild traumatic brain injury or whatever the authors decide to call it for that day. But with this review, the authors started this paper off with um, concussion is a common injury that is often poorly identified, underreported, and undermanaged. And, um, you know, finally someone just kind of gets it. This condition is a big problem. It affects a big part of our population. Um, people are not reporting it or they're badly reporting it. And, um, you know, they're using this let's wait and see approach. And in some cases it's being badly managed. Um, so it was kind of cool to just get the introduction starting off that way. Um, what do we know about it already? Um, as concussion is an injury, most adults recover in 14 days. So within that first two weeks, um, it's the 10 to 30 percent of patients that will have persistent symptoms negatively affect their quality of life. Um, it's often these individuals that we see in our respective clinics um, that will be referred by ACC or um, GPs that don't make a recovery. We know rehabilitation programs facilitate recovery. So we start off with this 24 to 48 hour of brief rest periods from cognitive or physical activity. We then start a stepwise return to physical activity. And um, you know that physical activity can include the physical interventions, which is an active rehab approach, um, neck treatment, or vestibular ocular um, therapy. We know treatment is complex and we need to address um, a large number of symptoms. And this can range from headaches, dizziness, neck pain, balance, vestibular, ocular motor, or cognitive impairments. When you look at their um, inclusion criteria, as I mentioned before, it was um, randomized controlled trials. Um, their participants would be individuals that suffered a concussion or a mild traumatic brain injury. Um, and they looked at all age groups and all genders. The interventions um, would be the, you know, the active rehab approach. It would be neck treatment. It would be vestibular therapy, ocular motor therapy. Their outcome measures would be looking at their symptom severity score. It would look at the days it took to recover or return to sport or work. They would measure the patient's balance or gait or physical activity. Um, and the comparison would be um, sham intervention or standard care. And I think just, you know, for a definition, what the authors described as sub-threshold exercise um, would be exercise at 80 to 90 percent of heart rate where um, our symptoms would then be or these patient symptoms would be exacerbated. Um, and so that's like the active rehab approach. The authors um, included these tables at the end of the article that looks a bit more into depth into each of the randomized controlled trials that we used. And um, so they looked a little bit more into depth in the study groups. They looked at the comparison versus the intervention. Um, what was the outcome measure that they used? And then what was the actual outcome of that randomized controlled trial? So I strongly encourage um, you guys to get, spend a bit more time looking at those tables because you soon will find out it's not all as it seems. And so I think we see this with the first intervention, um, the active rehab approach. Um, this was the author's outcome. So they said, you know, small to moderate effect in reducing symptoms after a concussion. So for the authors, at worst, it meant that exercise had a small effect in reducing symptoms. But importantly, it showed that it didn't make the symptoms worse. Um, and so the review found actually no difference in days to symptom recovery between those receiving the exercises and the comparison group. Now, for most of us working within the concussion service and working with this patient population, we'll know the benefit of exercise as an intervention, and especially this active rehab approach where we look at sub-threshold exercises or, um, you know, what we specifically 
prescribe for patients. So all of you should be thinking, that doesn't make sense. Um, you know, how can we say that exercise doesn't really make a big difference um, to patients? So I actually spent some time looking at those different randomized control trials that looked at um, sub-threshold exercises and intervention. And I looked at the study design and I looked at what was actually the comparison. And so this is what I found um, as a limitation for me for their methodology. They had small study samples that they then further divided into comparison and intervention. It often was a study sample that comprised of young adolescents, so they normally were already fit and young. Would you then see a difference between comparison and intervention? Um, the comparison group often was included into a stretching program, so you're still doing some form of exercise. Um, it might just be a bit of more easier exercise that still could increase your heart rate. Only one study looked at um, buffalo concussion treadmill test or explicitly mentioned that it looked at that. So, you know, we kind of have to ask if they were prescribing an active rehab approach, there needs to be some form of protocol and parameters in place. So what was the assessment they based this intervention on? How was it measured? And was there any specific strict guidelines that patients were meant to follow? If we want to achieve maximum benefit for an active rehab approach, we need patients to achieve that level or that threshold where symptoms are slightly exacerbated. And then a plan should be developed around that and then appropriately reviewed using that assessment tool like a buffalo concussion, concussion treadmill test um, and then followed through. Um, one other thing they looked at, or one of the studies, told patients to go about their merry way, walk to class, and do things that all young adolescents do. Um, and so the intervention for that was 20 minutes of cycling. And so you kind of have to ask yourself, would you have picked up a big difference between intervention and comparison then? This made me feel a bit more at ease, because if anything, you know, at least we know that the comparison for the intervention still was exercise. It might just have been a lighter form of exercise. And, um, and so I still strongly encourage, and I will probably still, for our, you know, our way of approaching patients, say that we still need to do a sub-threshold exercise program, but we need to tailor it and specific, you know, keep it specific to that patient based on a buffalo concussion treadmill test. Um, and so, yeah, so to me, probably won't be using that outcome or result to inform my practice. And it's always good to go look at, you know, what was the actual comparison. For the actual um, or for the other interventions, they looked at the neck treatment and the vestibular therapy. They found limited evidence if it was used just as neck treatment or just as vestibular therapy. But if you incorporate it into a multimodal collaborative approach, then they found this really good positive outcome, which is great. So that's good. We want to know that, you know, if we use this multimodal treatment approach that you base on objective findings and symptoms reported from the neck assessment um, and balance and vestibular assessment, then you find, a, you know, a better approach. Um, and so the author's outcome was, you know, you were three times more likely to be cleared or returned to sport in eight weeks compared with the control group. So in a way, I do agree with the authors that um, an individually tailored multimodal intervention is the best approach. And I see the benefit of it every day in our service, but I almost want to change the multimodal to multidisciplinary um, because you know the one size fits all approach no longer is clinically applicable or patient centered. And having an MDT approach is of best benefit. Um, so we need to identify within that first initial assessment whether the, you know, what's the dominant or the predominant symptom cluster. So in the slide, I kind of put the um, six main ones that we find in that initial assessment. And then, you know, you need to be aware that sometimes patients can have more than one um, symptom cluster as well. And so within our own approach, we have different specialist team members that all play their part in the overall recovery of our patients and um, the management of their concussion. I think I'm getting there, Mark. I'm almost at the end. Um, cool. So for me, what was missing in this review, um, you know, I think they started off great and they had the right idea, but there was a few things missing. There was this MDT approach where we were missing a couple of very important team members. We were missing our occupational therapists. We were missing the clinical psychologists and we were missing mental health and well-being um, interventions. And I still feel like they're physical interventions as well. Um, most of the research was based on those first two weeks post-injury, and so to base that on our patient, 
um, patient population, early intervention requires early referral and early allocation. So we need to see patients earlier to make an impact to their overall recovery. We have an acute clinic service. We run through the week at both our clinics um, where our aim is to see these sports-related concussions or concussion injuries within that very important acute stage and identify and manage them according to their specific um, profile. Um, so yeah, and then research always means more research. And so a paper that was published by um, one of our specialists as well just showed that, you know, within that first two weeks, you know, it's less than half of the patients that really make a full recovery. Um, so we kind of always have to just not always take research on face value and make sure we read all the designs. Um, my conclusion, like I said, I think they had the right idea when they started, but they missed a couple of key points here. And we always need to be careful when we read an article to take everything at first glance. Um, so yeah, multidisciplinary approach individually tailored to that patient um, and, you know, categorize them in a domain. Um, and it might be more than one domain or symptom cluster. Um, that was awesome, Mel. I'm not looking forward to going after you. Um, <laughs> that was really good. And well, your your language is going to be a lot better and a lot less shaky. <laughs> I'm not sure, actually. You, um, you know that. So three times more likely to recover with um, modal treatment. Pretty amazing. Yeah. And I think if they were doing it multidisciplinary, it would be a lot quicker as well. And um, because they were doing it multimodal in one disciplinary, so it was only in a physiotherapy cluster that they looked at it. So they kind of missed a big a big part of the recovery. And I, I think I remember reading that original paper that looked at cervical and vestibular physiotherapy with that randomized controlled trial when the patients that were randomized to the control group swapped over to the intervention group, my memory is that they yeah. did better. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Am I still sharing or am I stopped sharing? I, uh, I took control and stopped sharing. Oh, so cool. Okay, good. <laughs> <There's> a... <laughs> yeah. So, and I think that's, I just wanted to go back to those tables that was at the end of the article, because it's quite at the end. So I think a lot of people just read the article and they just kind of go their way. So I think it's important to, like you said, kind of compare, what they were actually comparing it to. Mm. So there's a couple of questions came up here. Um, one says, well done from Sarah. Um, the question here is, what, what would the sub-special, what would sub, sub-threshold exercise program include? Um, are there, is so, there you, you include that we have? So I guess that was one of the limitations for me. They kind of just gave this broad definition that it was 80 to 90% of your max heart rate, where, you know, it was only one of the randomized control trials that looked at a structured Buffalo concussion treadmill test. Um, so I think the short answer is 80 to 90% of max heart rate that would bring on your symptoms. Um, and then you do need someone like a clinical exercise physiologist to kind of you know, tailor an approach or a treatment that's a sub-threshold or an active rehab approach. So if that answers that. Great. And, and then another question around, uh, again, saying awesome, um, which it was, um, at what stage post-concussion do you start a sub-threshold exercise vestibular neck program? And um, that's question number one. So why don't you go with that? Okay, so um, this these RCTs, like this review, focused at that first two weeks. And so I think it's very difficult to apply it to our patient um, population because it would be great if we can start in those first two weeks, which, you know, we're trying to do with our acute clinics that we run at the clinic. Um, because that's when you can really start with it. So I think if you can identify impairments both for the neck, for exercise or vestibular early on, you can really start to make a difference. And that's what a lot of the research is showing now as it gets published. Um, and the, the second part to that question was, do you think there's anything in the paper that will change your practice or is it more just reinforcing your practice? Um, no, it's just, it's, I was a little bit upset when I saw, and I hope my meme gave that emotion, when I saw that they weren't really pro-exercise, which, you know, in our practice, we, we give every patient some form of structured exercise program. So if anything, you know, I kind of question their outcome. And so I think to me, what I would change is the multidisciplinary um, approach and, you know, giving patients the exercise. So kind of what we're already doing and just reinforcing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I think possibly the last question is around 
in your experience, would you, in a physiotherapy role, look at breathing pattern dysfunction with concussion clients, um, help uh, clients achieve a state of rest, or would that be something you delegate to others within the MDT? Um, I personally would not do it. I know Catherine Force is really good at doing breathing. I um, I think there's some people that are better in that scope of practice. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something we do advocate for. Um, I know our occupational therapist does a lot of good work with that as well. Um, so yeah, I think it's, you know, staying within your scope of practice. And if you've got the expertise to do it, by all means go. Um, but I'm always happy to give that one to someone else. Uh, uh, what I would say, though, is I think you're very good, and I think most of the team is very good within their consultation at offering reassurance um, and encouraging calm. So it might not necessarily be prescribing breathing activity, but I think we all have an opportunity with whatever condition to provide some form of reassurance and and um, whether that's from some education. I'm rambling. Education. <laughs> I think you do pretty well, Melissa, so I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't cool. do it there. So, um, any more questions, feel free to, to kind of keep popping them through. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Um, and so my paper um, is also hot off the press at uh, the BJSM. Um, it's the first time I've ever shared an online presentation. So um, it's a randomized controlled trial from Finland, which compares two surgical procedures for the treatment of anterior inferior um, bog standard um, anterior instability. Um, and one of the things that drew me to this is because there are not that many randomized controlled trials that look at surgical interventions. Um, and so I thought that that was um, worth talking about. Um, from the looks of this, this looks like it's going to be the start of a, a kind of more long-term follow-up study. So this is looking at two-year outcomes, um, but I suspect what we might see over the next kind of five to 10 years is what the longer-term outcomes are. Um, just to, these are some kind of crappy pictures that I got off the internet, but I just wanted to be sure that everybody knew what we were talking about with regard to these two operations. So a band cut repair done arthroscopically tries to restore normal shoulder anatomy. So repairs the damage that happens during a dislocation, um, repairs the labrum um, as opposed to a Lattage procedure, which is the other surgical arm, which is a non-anatomic um, surgical procedure, which involves taking the coracoid process, essentially bolting it onto the anterior aspect of the glenoid um, to try and make a mechanical block for further instability. So. Um, they're two quite different procedures, um, and I'm just going to actually have to lose the pictures because I can't see my slides. So um, there was quite a reasonably good-sized cohort of 122 young men. Um, so important to highlight that um, there were no young women in the in the cohort. So it does kind of limit the generalizability of what we have to to women. Um, and while the cohort did have some sporty patients in it. Um, there wasn't really discussion about what sport was performed, what level of sport. Um, but as you'll see in a minute, it does talk a little bit about return to sport and how successful people are at getting back to those sports, which in this cohort was not that successful. Um, the primary outcome measure was um, further instability or further surgical intervention at two year follow up. Um, but they do also look at some secondary measures like uh, patient recorded outcome measures, um, a feeling of apprehension. Um, radiologic measures of osteoarthritis. So everyone had an X-ray and an MRI scan at two year follow up. And so there were a, a range of different secondary um, outcome measures. Oh, my computer's saying no. Um, anyway, so then the, the main outcome was that there was a significantly different rate of recurrence um, between the bank out operation um, and the people that had a Lattage which for those of you that have read about these types of operations before, shouldn't really be a big surprise because um, there are some quite large cohort studies and case series um, which show that, that, that there is a, a lower rate of recurrence with people that have Lattage operations. Um, so that's fairly significant, 21% compared to 2%. Um, so I guess that's an important thing to counsel our patients that if we are thinking about um, referring them to consider a bank out operation or an arthroscopic bank out operation, 
um, they may need to accept that there's an increased risk of recurrence. And so thinking about what sport they play and quantifying the risk of further instability might be an important consideration. So this may not be something that you want to offer um, collision sport athletes or um, those who have more high demand jobs. Um, the other thing here is that the patients who had a ladder J operation were more likely to return to their previous level of sport. So if we have a look, that's at two year follow up. So at two years, people who played competitive sport who had an arthroscopic shoulder procedure had a 9% probability of getting back to sport, which um, is pretty sad, really, um, which either speaks to the Finnish population um, or the quality of the surgery or the surgical procedure itself, because we'll talk to Simon in a minute, but it'd be interesting to get his take on what um, he thinks an acceptable level of recurrence is um, with a surgical procedure, because that is not wildly different to the, the um, results of uh, rehabilitation in young active people. Um, one other thing that was interesting in this group is that the risk of surgical complications between the two groups in the study was quite similar. Um, there are other studies which show that the latter procedure has a high rate of post-operative complications. Um, there are some studies which show that your shoulder is stiffer afterwards, which is um, something to consider, which perhaps is not as um, important in people playing football. Um, but if you're looking at some more artistic sports or people that do a lot of overhead activity, um, the latter day is going to be problematic. Um, and the two year follow up means that we don't really know what the longer term outcomes are with these surgical procedures in, in terms of developing osteoarthritis and um, chondral disease. But what the study showed at two years based on x rays and MRI scans, there were no major difference between the two groups. So I guess the, the main advantage, I think, of this paper is its study design. So the, the randomized controlled trial aspect um, is, is a definite stream. Um, there's no blinding, obviously, because uh, one's an arthroscopic procedure and one's an open procedure. But I guess the weaknesses here, we kind of talked about as we went through, that there's a, a relatively speaking short follow-up period a limited number of sports participants, and I, I find that that number of returning to sport um, quite hard to interpret or, or kind of accept. Um, and I guess two things that um, for this audience, which I think are predominantly a sports medicine and a physiotherapy audience, um, there's no real discussion about the type of sport that was played, and there's no real discussion about return to sport process. So how were they cleared to return to sport? Was that standardized? There's no real information about the rehabilitation protocol was that standardized across the two groups. Um, so there are some things there that perhaps might have led to um, a lower rate of return to sport, um, less motivation potentially from the, from the patient, um, and potentially they were under rehabilitated and weren't prepared well to get back to sport. So there are some questions there about what they, what they had done. Um, one thing in the New Zealand context uh, to consider is that the operation looked at arthroscopic bank up procedure versus a ladder J procedure. Um, there is another procedure which is quite common in New Zealand in collision sport athletes um, called an open bank up uh, repair. So the same operation is the arthroscopic repair except it's done through an open incision. Um, and generally the literature would suggest that there's a lower rate of recurrence um, after an open bank up repair than there is after an arthroscopic bank up repair. Um, so look on the whole, I thought it was quite a good paper. Um, but I think that there were some limitations. And I think the key take home for me is um, really around considering what is the role for an arthroscopic bank out repair in young active people, particularly those with high rates of or, or high uh, demand collision sport athletes. Um, and is that an operation that you would want to consider if you were you know, even a professional footballer, whether that you wouldn't classify that typically as a high risk sport, there might be some upside in terms of return to sport, you might get back to playing quicker. Um, but if you return to sport, the probability of return to sport is less than 10% and your risk of recurrence inside two years is over 20%. That may not be an operation that you would want to consider. Um, so I, I thought the paper was was a good one. Um, I think the any sort of randomized controlled trial um, is worth discussing in a sports medicine context because there just aren't that many. Um, it'd be interesting to get Simon's take on, on what he thinks about arthroscopic bank out repair in, in that kind of patient group. Um, but I see there's a, a 
question there um, to me. Ah, to me. So any consideration to which surgical procedure, um, anatomical variables, wingspan, factors of activity, um, not really in this paper. So that's, I think, part of the, the active decision making. So that they're, they're all grouped together as young, active male patients um, who've had anterior instability. So that's really the, the main consideration in this paper. There's no sort of more stratification saying, well, look, are these patients, are the sort of individual things about them that, that probably will guide our treatment decisions. Um, so I think all of those things are important considerations. What do they do? What do they look like? Um, what is their probability of returning to, to that high, uh, high demand activity and do they want to? Um, so those are all, I think, important things to, to take into consideration. Um, Simon, do you, do you ever take it? What do you? Yeah, do you yeah um, I think it's a great paper and um, well presented. They, um, uh, this is my favorite shoulder operation by far, the latter day. Um, and I sort of came back largely doing arthroscopic bank heart repairs and a 22% failure rate is about what I've found as well. And, and when you think about it, that's every fifth person you've operated on comes back with a poor outcome. Like it's, in, it's incredibly frustrating. And you go in there, they come to see you for an operation to stabilize their shoulder. And one in five, it doesn't work. Um, and you, can you go back to sharing your screen and showing that, um, that graphic? Um, just a picture of the latter day. Because the, 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 the essential lesion when somebody dislocates their shoulder is the... Um, the Bankart lesion, and if you go that slide before that, um, it, it's the detachment of the labrum there. So the, the attraction to surgeons of a, of a Bankart repair is that you're correcting the anatomical defect. So you, you're doing something anatomic. You're, you're reattaching what was torn off to lead the, to cause the re recurrence in the first place. And, but in some people, not only have they torn off the labrum, but they've also worn away the bone, especially in people who've, come, uh, who've had multiple dislocations or they've uh, fractured off a bit of bone. So the actual glenoid rim is, is narrower. And so that's sort of where people use the latter day was where somebody had bone loss um, or in, in somebody who's had a failed arthroscopic repair, you know, the latter day was the, was the backup operation because it was seen as something that was on an atopic. But it is a sort of, I worked through my shoulder practice, you sort of notice that actually the, this, the patients came back recovering much quicker than after an arthroscopic repair. Um, often it's sort of three months, they're moving the shoulder and feeling much more stable with a much lower recurrence rate. And I kind of feel that this operation makes you believe in a divine being and intelligent design because it's like you, you're trying to stabilize the shoulder and, and you need a piece of bone. You look around and there's one right there, just, just sitting up to three centimeters from the glenoid where you need it. And not only that, it's got a big long tendon attached to it which when your arm's in the position of instability runs exactly in front of the socket to hold it in place. So the effect of this, is not, this operation isn't just about the bone block. It's also the fact that it's got the conjoint tendon attached to it. So it's a sling effect in the position of instability. And, and those two things together make it kind of bulletproof. So I mean, I, I've now sort of largely stopped doing shoulder surgery, just doing knee, but um, that, that by the end of my sort of shoulder practice, that was largely the, uh, the only operation I was doing for shoulder instability. I, I would, look for any reason, you know, any sort of bone loss or, or a contact athlete, con collision athlete, um, because it, it just works. And most and patients, when you talk to them about the option of an arthroscopic or uh, they, they don't really mind, you know, they just sort of look at you and glaze over. Really what they want is their shoulder to not stop dislocating. And there's just no question that the latter day does that better than an arthroscopic repair. Um, and especially in a high risk athlete, I think it's a um, no brainer. There's probably a little bit of concern about what happens long-term, you know, is this non-anatomic thing going to lead to, risk of arthritis. And there are some bad complications that you can get from it, like fracture or you know, screws being placed in the wrong place. Um, so it's, it's not, not, not perfect, no operation is, but um, I, I think like anything, if you do a lot of it, you get better and those complications get reduced. So uh, I'm, I'm a strong advocate of the, of the latter day. I was thinking about this in, in reference to Benji Marshall. So I don't, I don't know if you guys remember, but Benji Marshall early in his career just had recurring shoulder instability. Um, and I don't know what procedures he had, but I suspect being based in Australia, he yeah. probably had some arthroscopic procedures with a, a view to returning to, to rugby league quickly. Um, and I suspect then he dislocated and dislocated and dislocated and probably ended up with a ladder jet. So, yeah, um, yeah that's I, a really yeah. common common sequence. But now I think if you saw any collision athlete, no matter whether what degree of bone loss, I, I would argue that they should have a ladder jet mm -hmm. as, the, as the primary operation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, 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 period of time you know recovering from two shoulder surgeries probably yeah. fills most most players professional sporting career absolutely yeah absolutely yeah. 
would come back from that. So, and in terms of like long-term risk of arthritis, it's probably the, the number of dislocations that's more important than the surgical stabilization procedure. Um, some of the some of the old ones were really quite brutal, not Lerge, but other ones where they were putting staples in the front of the shoulder and they were strongly associated with operations called the Pudi Plat and others that really did have a big correlation with um, uh, with stiffness and OA, but but th that hasn't really yet been shown with the Lerge. And it's been around a long time. It's a it's a French have been doing it for decades. So so there is is some long term data on it. But yeah, I did fun. look at the long term data and it looks more encouraging than I thought it did. Um, mm. But it'll be interesting to see what happens to this cohort over the next yeah. Time. Yeah, it's a great trial. It's a great trial. So yeah. um, anyway, enough about that. Um, you've you've hijacked my paper as well as your paper, so I'll do my best to butt into to your paper. Yeah, sorry. There. Um, <laughs> um, so I will um, do this and then can I share screen? Uh, uh, share screen on that. Oh, can, are you going to let me share the screen or not? I've just uh, given you the authority. The authority, okay. Uh, desktop two, I'll do that. Share. Is that sharing okay? It is good. Good. So, um, yeah, this uh, after a paper talking about what a great operation that actually is, and they're going to talk about a paper that sort of discourages people from having surgery. So this is quite a well-known study called the Fidelity Study. Um, and this particular paper is just presenting the five-year results. And so it's comparing arthroscopic partial meniscectomy for a degenerate meniscal tear and uh, compared to placebo operation. Um, and it's quite, there's, there's a few studies like this, but I think this is one of the most well-done uh, studies on it. And I'll sort of talk through why as we go through the methods. So uh, they... Uh, this is the sort of flow chart for it. And uh, to talk you through it, they looked at 205 patients. And the thing I find extraordinary is that there were 24 uh, who declined to participate. Like if you ask 205 New Zealand patients, look, we're going to give you an operation, either a real one or a fake one. I'm pretty sure there'd be like five who would agree. But in Finland, there were only 24 out of that 200 who didn't want to participate in this. So I find that extraordinary. Um, and the 18 got better with, while waiting for the operation, but these were the sort of patients they were recruiting. So they were aged 35 to 65 years. They had to have symptoms for more than three months. They had to have a degenerative medial meniscal tear. So this was only medial meniscus. And they had to be unresponsive to conservative treatment, but no advanced knee osteoarthritis. So a little bit of cartilage change was, was acceptable, but, but no, no significant osteoarthritic change. Um, but, it, but I think a relatively short duration of symptoms there of, of only three months before they were able to be enrolled. Um, so then following it through it, they uh, had 160 who underwent the um, arthroscopy and then a handful of those were excluded because say they had a tear in the lateral meniscus or significant contra flap or underwent a repair or microfracture, leaving 146 that were randomized. And so the, what, they, what they did to the two patients was bring them to the operating room and they were randomized either to arthroscopic partial metastectomy or to placebo surgery. So the surgery, surgeon wasn't blinded, but everybody else, uh, including the, the people doing the follow-up, reading the x-rays and even writing the paper were, were um, blinded. The patients in the arthroscopic partial medial mastectomy group had the, uh, the damaged part of the meniscus removed. In the placebo surgery, they actually had an arthroscopy. So they had a full arthroscopy and the surgeon pretended to take out the meniscus. So they, the paper says that they simulated the sounds of a meniscus being removed, used the shaver and, and uh, then took the same amount of time as for the other procedure. Uh, and Yes, yeah, so <laughs> I'm not sure how they did it. I guess they could just turn the shaver on and wave it around. Yeah, sure. Well, that would be that's a good impression, actually. Yeah, good. Thanks. Um, and then analyzed. Uh, yeah, just, a, a few I'm lost sure. a follow up in the two groups. Um, and the thing I found extraordinary with this is that they had a writing committee. And when they analyzed the data, they didn't, uh, they kept themselves blinded. So they wrote two versions of the paper. Uh, with depending on which group. So they wrote it one way with the results suggesting uh, one uh, when they broke the code, then the other paper for breaking the code the other way. So, and then when they broke the code and said, oh, this group was the placebo, this one was the arthroscopic partial mastectomy, uh, they then sent the correct version of the paper off to, to, to be published. And they've already published their two-year results, and this is now out to five years showing the same thing, that the WOMET score, which is a patient-reported outcome measure, no difference at all between placebo and arthroscopic partial uh, meniscectomy. And this, this isn't sort of new. There's a few other randomized trials, all seem to be from Scandinavia. They must be happy to have sham surgery in Scandinavia. 
um, showing no difference in proms, pain scores, other scores such as a license score for at six months, 12 months and all the way up. But interestingly, like both groups get significantly better. Um, so even the placebo group got, got better from having a camera put in their knee. Um, probably what got, they got better from was this sort of surgically induced physiotherapy program that they both, all patients went un, under afterwards. Um, but, but certainly there was improvement in both arms, but no difference. But what's the new finding from this study is that now out of five years, they took x-rays of everybody. And this is sort of a terrible way they presented the data. But essentially, that score at the bottom, ORSI score, is a measure of radiographic um, osteoarthritis. So it looks at joint space narrowing and osteophytes. And the, the gray or the um, dark gray lines are the placebo surgery. And the white lines are the um, arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. And so this is the change in the degree of radiographic arthritis from preoperative to five years. So the bigger the number on, the, on that x-axis along the bottom, um, the more progression they had of arthritis. So you see all the people in the placebo surgery tend to be at this end of the graph, which means they had less progression of arthritis, but there's more people with progression of the um, of arthritis in the people who had an arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. It wasn't a huge difference. It was about a 13% difference um, uh, in progression of arthritis, but, but definitely measurable and, and definitely um, uh, worse in the arthroscopic partial meniscectomy group. And this is kind of perhaps maybe what you would think, right? So when you do an arthroscopic partial meniscectomy, you kind of have to judge how much meniscus to take. And so sure, you'll be taking a bit of defunction meniscus that's not really doing, any, doing them any favors, but you also don't want them to re-tear. So you tend to sort of take a little bit more just to make sure you've got a stable margin before you finish. And so the, the, for sure, you're probably removing some meniscus that would be functional for them and, and present preventing uh, progression of arthritis. So this is perhaps not, not surprising. Um, in terms of these secondary outcomes, the things they looked at at five years, I think an interesting one is how many people then underwent another arthroscopy, because you might think people who had the sham surgery just would end up coming back later for another one. And everyone who was enrolled in this trial was promised that if you're not better after six months, we'll let you have another operation. But only 10% of the people, 9% in the placebo group had another surgery. And same for the arthroscopy um, in the people who actually had the meniscectomy. So it's 60%, so no real statistical difference between the two. And more people went on to a total knee replacement um, in the meniscectomy group than the placebo group, although that wasn't statistically significant. Um, in terms of satisfaction rates, overall 80% in both groups were happy with either the real surgery or the fake one. Uh, and the people who progressed to what you would call clinical arthritis was pretty low in, in both groups. Uh, so overall, uh, they concluded that arthroscopic partial meniscectomy provided no benefit for knee symptoms. And this was kind of already known. So in a degenerate meniscal tear, placebo surgery versus surgery doesn't really result in a difference in the outcome. But this is the first paper that's really showed that the arthroscopic meniscectomy actually made them radiographically worse in terms of arthritis. So how to interpret this? I think it really reinforces that arthroscopic meniscectomy for older patients with a degenerate tear should not be the first line. There's a lot of criticism, like this is really a widely talked about paper. And one of the big things is that they only waited three months before enrolling them in the trial. So this cohort of patients um, perhaps isn't say who I would do an arthroscopic partial meniscectomy on. You know, you wanna be waiting um, much longer than that for somebody with a stable degenerate tear. And it doesn't include people who've got a, a locked knee, so a big fragment that's displaced or a flat folded down the gutter, which really that sort of mechanical structural problem, it's very hard for that to see how that can get better without, without a surgical procedure to remove it. But that's actually a fairly uh, small subgroup of patients, right? You can usually tell quite clearly from the MRI scan which ones those are because you can see the meniscal flap folded down or the bucket handle tear flip forward. Um, but there's, there's um, I think, a, a different cohort of maybe somebody who's been five, six, seven months down the line um, who doesn't have significant arthritic change, but still has persistent symptoms, who can get better after the surgery. But in truth, you know, I, I say that I've got lots of patients who that's happened to, but you also don't worry if they got better because I did the surgery because of the placebo. So um, I think just the, the overall message here is just be very cautious, recommending an arthroscopic procedure um, in somebody with a genetic meniscal tear. Um, and it should never really ever be your first line treatment unless there's a, a, a displaced uh, flap or locked knee. So I'll de-share there. Cool. Um, I'm sure there's some questions probably about that. So, I mean, I have, I have a question. So I was at a conference where there was a, a super heated argument between one of the authors of this earlier paper um, and one of your orthopedic colleagues <clears throat> about the, what is a degenerative tear? 
And so as yeah. someone who goes out and twists their knee and goes from having no symptoms to suddenly having quite a few symptoms quite quickly, so there's some form of trauma that has a degenerative pattern of tear, so like a horizontal tear or something like that. Yeah. Would you consider that to be a degenerative tear or is that a traumatic tear? Yeah, I find that, I find that hard to, to elucidate too, right? And does it really matter as well? You know, like, but there's definitely different characteristics of tears. You know, horizontal cleavage is different to a, a flat tear. which is different to a meniscal root tear, uh, different to a big bucket handle tear. Um, but the, the, all of those tears can be either degenerate or, um, or traumatic in nature. And, and, you know, in this, in this country, right, everything's traumatic because of, because of ACC. So everybody remembers an injury and, and patients are sort of attuned to that. Um, so I, I'm, I still sort of wonder how, how I would replicate this trial in New Zealand. And I, I would find it extraordinarily hard to convince people to have a sham surgery. And, and I wouldn't be telling them to do that even at three months, right? You know, I, I think it's, um, it, it's, it's when you've got a single patient sitting in front of you, I, you this, this data sort of tells you to be cautious. That's how I sort of interpret it. Um, but really, you know, you, whether you decide to offer them surgery is a factor of how, what their symptoms are, what the MRI scan looks like, how long, what other treatments they've tried, you know, and, and also if they're on the time course. And the, the struggle is, though, is that the people, even with the placebo surgery, got better. So if you do the operation, whether it's actually making a difference or not, it, it, they will come back and give the surgeon the impression, yeah, I got better. So, so that reinforces the, the surgeon's idea that I did the right thing. Um, mm -hmm. But it may not have been the, the act of surgery that made it better. And there's other lots of operations that are probably in this category, like um, shoulder acromioplasty now, the study's showing a similar thing. Um, surgery is a really powerful placebo, and it's, it's hard for surgeons to tease that out because... When you see the patient back in clinic, they tell you they've got better. You, you think you've done a good job. Um, a couple of questions. One, I suspect you can't answer. Um, it's about is sham surgery. Does it have a better outcome compared to no surgery? So we talked a little uh, bit. Uh, as far as I know, yes. Yeah, I. Um, because be. they're not blinded but it, it's the, the placebo effect is it's it's the thought process right the, the patient has to believe that they've had the surgery um so making the cuts is is different to just pretend you know you, you, if they if they don't believe they've had the surgery then um then the placebo effect is not as strong um but i mean you could the act of putting the camera in the knee and rushing the water around did that have an effect i mean who know who knows i mean they may be able to just made the cuts and then slap the patient in the face and woke them up and their knee would have got better you, you don't you don't really know um but even there's even studies now showing that you can give people a placebo pill tell them it's a placebo and they get better um, it's a, it's a, it's a whole, there's a whole body of research on the placebo effect. And, and the things that I take is, is just extraordinary how powerful it is, um, the placebo effect and, and especially the surgical placebo effect. Yeah. And another comment here about the Australian landscape. So in Australia, arthroscopic surgery for partial meniscectomy without locking is no longer funded by Medicare. Should the study not be the gold standard for most orthopods in New Zealand? And I'd say it has had a massive impact, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, so the, the rate, I've seen some Australian data showing that the, the impact of, uh, or the number of arthroscopic procedures to drop after these, because there's a few trials like this that have come out in the last decade, but it's kind of, it has plateaued. Um, I think there's quite a difference in, um, uh, in New Zealand uh, between older surgeons and younger surgeons. Um, sometimes I see patients in the public system who've come, you know, like the, yeah, there's, there's a small space on your list, so that a person gets transferred from that seen a different surgeon initially. Um, and being booked for an arthroscopy and I sometimes look at the knee and the degree of arthritis in there and just think oh my god what was what how on earth could you put this patient on for a knee arthroscopy but um, um many many older surgeons that's just the way they've always practiced and in the 90s it was a really common procedure to tell you oh, we're going to we're going to be knee wash out we're just going to get a clean up um and because of that placebo effect so many of those people got better so it was a reinforcing thing and I think a lot of surgeons still sort of um, have that belief you know my patients get better I think it is challenging when you see those patients who there's an expectation in the community, isn't it? That if you have a meniscus, you have yep. an arthroscopy. Yep, absolutely, yeah. And it, it's very hard to talk someone out of it, right? You know, it's because they've tried everything out, it's not working, I've got all these knee symptoms. Um, uh, why can't I have a surgery? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. The patient, patient desire is a big part of that. Cool. Well, um, look, I think those were four quite different papers. We've kind of rolled through our, our hour, so I don't think there are any more questions. So. Um, well, I was going to do the poll. Let's quickly do this poll. So what are you thinking about next week? Are you planning on seeing any face-to-face -face patients? So again, this is just purely for the just discussion this evening. So the poll, I think, is coming up. Have you guys got it? Um, 
So just I, I see, I've kind of got myself confused about levels and phases and different things. But my understanding is that the, the recommendations around physiotherapy is that when it goes to phase two of level three, that's when physiotherapy practices are thinking about starting up again. So um, the, the poll actually is it's pretty similar, actually. So there's probably a few more of you out there thinking about seeing patients next week. So um, I don't know if you remember, or those of you that were on the call a few weeks ago, we were talking, it was about 15% of yes and unsure. Um, so it does look like there's probably more of you thinking about getting back into practice. Um, but what it was... I can add to, add to this poll. I saw five people today who I did an ACL reconstruction on two weeks ago, and uh, three of them had seen the physio for a face-to-face -face appointment, and two of them had seen them for a um, for a, via telehealth. Yeah. So, I mean, I, my personal view on that is that there are some patients, some things like that, that are acute, and if you're doing an operation on them, it would be important that they have the appropriate post-operative care. Absolutely, I totally support that. If anyone sort of said, "Should was this appropriate?" Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, I mean, I have started to refer some patients specifically back to physiotherapists because I know that they are able to see patients. So um, there's something from Rose that I'll link for a petition. But yeah, so look, I mean, yeah, we can definitely post that, Rose. So there's a petition about trying to get allied health professionals back to work. But I think that from my end, it's about we had some um, advice from WorkSafe about what was appropriate. Um, and the advice that the radiologist had was around um, if you could show that there was a clinical need for treatment within six weeks and the patient would be disadvantaged by not having the radiological procedure, then the DHB and the ministry was happy for them to continue. So um, I guess just when you're thinking about your own practice, obviously you want to be staying safe, you want to think about the relevant rules, but I think there are patients where there's a justification well, there's a need to see them. So I sent some patients out today, one who had um, some severe sciatica with radicular leg pain. Um, I had another patient who had um, had a bad ankle sprain, had been to the hospital and couldn't wait there, just had a, a mega ankle. So I think there are some things where if these people aren't getting treated, then they're going to have some negative impacts in terms of their ability to work, in terms of their ability to look after their kids. Um, and I think in your situation, Simon, my view would be that you know, they could have a very bad post-operative outcome. They end up very stiff with having another surgery. Um, and if the, they're able to see some physiotherapists, physiotherapy or get some physiotherapy in a controlled, safe environment, then that's what needs to happen. My own personal view. But anyway. Um, it's we'll... my view too. In fact, I just signed the petition and donated $20 too. All right. <laughs> yeah, bullshit. Anyway. I did. I did. It's on there. Click on it. <laughs> Um, okay, well, look, thanks, guys. Um, Melissa, I thought you were the best presentation. I thought you were the most organized, and I kind of, despite myself, enjoyed your gifts. Um, Chris, I totally agree about a little bit, but it was important. And um, I'm impressed also, Simon, that you're able to eat your fish and chips that you bought on the way to the uh, to <laughs> and make some slides and uh, present them well. So, and well done, guys. Thanks very much. And um, I think we'll probably do this again next week. I remember we did the, the the, the discussion is to have not a, a COVID topic, but we might try and pull something together from some colleagues in Melbourne around how they have practiced in an increasingly COVID um, infected landscape. So things like that, deep cleaning and um, masks and, and whatnot. So we'll see how that all goes. So um, thanks for joining us and uh, we'll look forward to catching you maybe next week. See you guys. Thanks, Rob. Thanks. Bye. See you guys. Bye.